Good morning. You're invited to participate in the morning worship service of First United Methodist Church in downtown Fort Worth, Texas. Grace and peace to you from the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you also. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for all the good things with which you fill our lives. We are humbled and encouraged by the vision of peace, justice, and freedom in Christ that draws us into the future. Mold us into your people in word and deed, in spirit and in truth. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
will find there before you attendance registration pads. Would you please register your presence and pass those pads down the pew so that all of our worshipers can do that? And to you who are joining our church today, would you please fill out a today card and bring it forward as we sing the last hymn that we may welcome you into First United Methodist Church. There are announcements on the insert uh, that deserve your attention. One about our youth and uh, their activities for the week and uh, continuing. And then some opportunities about uh, Thanksgiving uh, and uh, giving and worshiping that we hope you will be attentive to. And on the back, some announcements about your spiritual health and your physical health as well. We hope you will be attentive to those. And then on the inside of cover, uh, back cover of your bulletin, uh, announcement about the tour of our building today. Um, people admire our building from the outside and it certainly is admirable, but there are many, many beautiful things inside this building that deserve our attention as well. And if you'd like to uh, John, uh, join Bob and the others with a tour inside this building, we hope you'll meet near the piano after the service and you will be delighted with what you see and hear. And you see that the grief seminar begins today and tomorrow evening a very special musical program will be presented here uh, uh, to which I would uh, invite you. Uh, the uh, Spectrum will be in concert at 7 tomorrow evening, and they always do a great job for us. Our Bible studies continue while Mike takes on the um, wisdom literature beginning this evening at 6.30. You will want to be attentive to that announcement and the announcement about the greeting cards benefiting the United Community Centers. Beautiful pictures of our sanctuary there. And on the back, other announcements, including the one about the musical that will be presented here in uh, Wesley Hall a week from tonight, the Wesleyan Encore. We're trying to strengthen our ties with Texas Wesleyan University, our Methodist university in town, which deserves more attention than we have given it sometimes in the past. A week from this evening, free pies at 7.15, free pies at 7.15, <laughs> and the program will begin at 7.30, and we invite you to that as well. Our first lesson this morning is found in Psalms, chapter 139, verses 1 through 14, a reading from Psalm. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all of my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light around me become night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness as is light to you. For it was you who formed me in my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. This is the word of the Lord. Let us join our hearts and our spirits with the Severance and the Horton family as they bring their sons for baptism this morning. And let us all remember that it is under the sign of God's grace and mercy that all of us live.
Baptism is a sign to us of the mercy and grace of God, indicating that we do not come into relationship with God on the basis of anything that we ourselves do, but simply upon the basis of God's gracious initiative toward us. The baptism of children is a particularly significant manifestation of this sign. Remember the words of our Lord Jesus, how he said, let the children come unto me, do not forbid them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. This morning, uh, Brian Severance, uh, also comes uh, to join the church by profession of his faith in Christ and by baptism uh, himself. So I ask uh, all of you, as you stand in the presence of God in this congregation, do you affirm your faith in Christ? And do you promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, all nations, and all races? And will you nurture these children in Christ's holy church, that by your teaching and example they may be guided to accept God's grace for themselves, to lead a Christian life, and to, and to openly profess their faith? Okay. Now, Brian, if you will kneel. Brian, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brian, the Holy Spirit work within you, that being born of water and the Spirit, you will remain a faithful disciple of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. Okay. If you all stand over here. Jesse Jacob. Jesse Jacob, I baptize you in the name of the Father, <laughs> and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now if you'll place your hands on him, please. Jesse Jacob, the Holy Spirit work within you, that being born of water and the Spirit, you will remain a faithful disciple of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Take him for a moment. Witten Richard. <laughs> Witten Richard, I baptize you in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, if you'll place your hands on him, please. You can all gather around. <laughs> Witten, Richard, the Holy Spirit work within you, that being born of water and the Spirit, you will remain a faithful disciple of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> here we go. We have this other youngin over here. This is great. <laughs> it is. It's wonderful. What a privilege it is for all of us to participate in welcoming these new members of the household of faith. We also welcome Brian, of course, along with him, but Brian's too heavy to carry. <laughs> but we do... Uh, we do welcome them, and it is such a privilege we have to vow that we will do all in our power to uphold and care for them, to do all that we can to help their parents nurture them in the Christian faith. And all this is God's great gift offered to us without price. Yeah. Let us join in our response. With God's help, we will so order our lives after the example of Christ that Jesse, Jacob, and Whitten, Richard, surrounded by steadfast love, may be established in the faith and confirmed and strengthened in the way that leads to life eternal.
Let love be genuine and live in harmony. Hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Outdo one another in showing honor. Be humble and never conceited. Put love above all else. Let Christ's peace rule in your hearts. Always be forgiving as Christ has forgiven you. Do not love in word or speech only. Love also in deed and truth. Receive each other in sincerity. Find mercy and grow in faith together. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true Church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. We believe in God, who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the Church to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope in life, in death, in life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen.
And so what, O oh God, if in Christ we really did become a new creation? Would our quickness to take offense be replaced by patient self-control? Would our anger dissolve into understanding? Would our eagerness to fight be replaced by attempts peacefully to adjudicate disputes? Would our smallness turn into generosity? Would our peevishness be transformed into humility and gentleness? Would our energy to defend what we have be replaced by creative attempts to see that everyone has enough? Would our tribalism yield to a larger vision of all? And what, O oh God, if we really did no longer regard anyone from a human point of view? Would we refrain from judging people quickly and instead attempt to see things from another's point of view? Would we be able vividly to imagine the inner lives of others? Would we be able to appreciate the wonder of diversity and difference? Would compassion and kindness become our first response? And instead of hatred, violence, killing, and war, would peace break out everywhere? And that would there be human flourishing? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Our second lesson this morning is from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 through 21. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The word of the Lord.
Great to see all of you on this beautiful Lord's Day as we come together to worship God and to enjoy the great gift of Christian fellowship together. We come, as we come today, we hear the words of the Apostle Paul, as we heard read a moment ago from our epistle lesson, the second letter to the church at Corinth. And that reading begins with a therefore statement. A therefore statement. Paul says, therefore, from now on, we regard no one from a human point of view. Whenever I see one of those therefore statements in the scripture, I remember a sermon that Charles Allen preached at annual conference in the Texas Annual Conference uh, many years ago. And in that, he talked about the resolutions that we pass at a session of annual conference. Resolutions that are always worded in the same way. You know how resolutions are worded. Whereas, 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 and then therefore be it resolved. And I remember so well the way he talked about that in that wonderful Georgia accent, he said, uh, you know, in all these resolutions we pass, it says, whereas this and whereas that and whereas the other thing. We have all these whereases and I'm waiting for the therefore, he said. <laughs> My apologies to Charles Allen for imitating him in the pulpit. But he's got a good point. It's the therefore, isn't it, that carries the heart of the resolution. The whereas is talk about why we're doing this and talk about the, the uh, issues that are related to the resolution. They talk about the reasons and the theology behind it and all those kinds of things. And then it comes down to the therefore be it resolved. This is what we're going to do. That's the heart of it. And sometimes there are a lot of whereases that go before that. Well, in this particular passage, the whereas statements come just before our reading begins. And the Apostle Paul there is talking about the basis of this therefore. And he says, in effect, whereas the love of Christ urges us on, and whereas we are convinced that one has died for all, and whereas one has died for all, so that all who live might live no longer for themselves, but for the one who died and was raised again for them. Therefore, be it resolved that from now on, we will, view, we will not view others from a human point of view. We will no longer view anyone from a human point of view. For if anyone is in Christ, that person is a new creation. Now what Paul is talking about here, it seems to me, is very important for our life of faith, for us as individuals and for us as a community of faith, as the church. And that is the central question of how do we look at people? How do we view people? How do we see people? It's important. Because we live in a culture that is bent on seeing people from what Paul would call a human point of view. We see that, I think, most obviously in the makeover programs that are on TV, the so-called reality TV programs, where a person is, well, in one case, in one program, ambushed, the ambush makeover program, but the person is identified by so-called friends, relatives, as someone seriously in need of a makeover. Perhaps it's uh, sloppy clothing, it's clothing that's out of style, it's a perpetual bad hair day, although I don't understand that at all. <laughs> it is, uh, it is uh, perhaps uh, being out of shape. And some folks look at them and they determine that they're in need of a makeover. And so in come all the experts, the personal trainers, the hairstylists, the, uh, the clothing uh, consultants and designers, all with the intent of making this person over. 
all looking at them with a certain way of seeing. And so the person goes through this process of being made over, but the fact of the matter is, when all the cameras are gone and the lights are taken away, makeovers don't last very long. The clothes eventually go out of style or they wear out. Uh, the makeup runs out. Uh, the wrinkles return. Uh, the, the hair grows back, uh, theoretically, or falls out, I guess, either way. <clears throat> Those things change. They don't last. And it seems to me that there is a fundamental difference in the way people are viewed often in our society and, as a matter of fact, in just about any society throughout human history, including in Paul's day. And this other way of seeing that Paul is talking about. It's the difference between a makeover and transformation. For what Paul is talking about here, the context of this little passage of Scripture is the larger context of the transforming power of the love of God in Jesus Christ. And it's the difference between a makeover and a transformation. You see, in, in a makeover, uh, it only deals with the surface. Transformation goes through and through. Makeover is temporary, doesn't last. Transformation endures. A makeover gives you a new look outwardly. Transformation makes you, as Paul says, a new creation inwardly. So the question is, how do we, when we look at other people and when we look at ourselves, how do we see people? How do we view people. Larry Davies tells the story of a, of a nightclub that had an old piano in it, and the musicians who performed in that nightclub griped and complained about that piano all the time. It was an old beat-up thing. It was all scratched up, beat up. Uh, some of the notes didn't work. Some of the keys would stick from time to time, depending on the humidity. The thing was never in tune, just seriously in need of work. And the musicians complained and complained and complained. And finally, the owner decided he would do something. And he sent the piano out to be painted. Painted. What good does that do? See, the owner had a certain way of looking at that piano. And the musicians had another way of looking at the piano. For the owner, if you put a few coats of paint on it and it looks good on the outside, it's a good piano. For the musicians, when they looked at that, they saw not the outside, but the inside. They saw not the outward appearance, but what's going on inside that instrument. See, that's the difference in a way of seeing. How do we see our brothers and sisters? How do we see ourselves? Do we see ourselves only by what we can see with our eyes, by outward appearance, by what's on the surface? Or do we see with the eyes of Jesus, who saw people thoroughly as they are, inside, who they really are? See, so-called reality TV does not see the reality. But Paul calls us to this new way of seeing that's based on how God sees us. For in those verses prior to our text for today, Paul is talking about reconciliation. He's talking about being made new in Christ. And Paul is talking about the transformative power of what God has done for us in Jesus that changes everything, including the way we see. And Paul would say to us, it's not that I'm offering you an option here that you might choose to see people in a different way, but rather as people whose lives have been reconciled to God and to one another in Jesus, there is in fact a new way of seeing. And therefore we are resolved from this point on to no longer see people in a strictly human point of view. But with the eyes of Jesus, who could see people really as they are. 
and in the seeing still love them and accept them. How do we see people? It's critically important. An article in Psychology Today talked about how in the courtroom, people are, how people are seen and the outward appearance makes all the difference in the world. Psychologists have demonstrated conclusively that a defendant who is considered attractive has a better chance of acquittal. Or if not acquitted, has a better chance of receiving a lighter sentence than one who is considered unattractive. And so there's a whole industry about the image of the defendant and, and what's most appropriate to get across the right image. How people are seen makes a great deal of difference. I think about the movie Shrek, wonderful film, in fact, two wonderful films. And if you've not seen them, I encourage you to see them. But I think the thing that's so endearing about the film and that's so powerful about these films is that here is an ogre named Shrek who looks like an ogre. He is an ogre. But he's misunderstood. We learn as we get to know this character that he has a heart that's as big as his body is. And that he is full of kindness and gentleness and he's sensitive and he's loving. But people look at Shrek and they see an ogre. And Shrek says there's more to ogres than most people realize. And he says this, he says the world has a problem with me. They judge me before they even know me. So it's better for me to be alone. And I wonder how many people there are who could say those exact same words. The world has a problem with me. It judges me before it even knows me. And therefore it's better for me to be alone. Paul calls us to a new way of seeing. So that we see not what's on the outside. But we see in every person, including ourselves, a beloved child of God, loved and accepted by God. It's a new way of seeing, a way that we may not be accustomed to see. And yet it's exactly that way that we are called to look on our brothers and sisters and to look on ourselves as we take a look in the mirror as well. One of the contestants on uh, Ambush Makeover is named Nina Sadat. And at the end of the day, after she had gone through nine hours of makeup and hair and clothing makeovers, all of that, filming was done, she was interviewed about her experience. And she said, well, in, in one way it made me happy, in another way it made me very sad. She said, for a day, I was loved and accepted, just as I am. You see why that would make her both happy and sad? Do you hear what she's saying? For a day, for one day, she was loved and accepted just as she was. And then the lights went away and the cameras went away. And she was left with the notion that something was fundamentally wrong with her that required a makeover in the first place. And what does she do now? You see, the way of seeing to which Paul calls us is a daily way of seeing. And the love and acceptance of God, the grace of God is daily. It's day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year, forever and ever. And the way of seeing to which we are called, that way of seeing others with the love of Christ, others as children of God, loved and accepted by God, of seeing ourselves in that way is daily. It is to be constant. From now on, Paul says, we regard no one from a human 
point of view. Day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year. As a church, that's what we're called to do. The constancy of love and the constancy of the way of seeing every other person as a beloved child of God, loved and accepted as they are. That's powerful. It is that powerful word of reconciliation that Paul talks about all the time. Paul says that since we have been reconciled to God, God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. And the us there Paul was speaking of was himself and his colleagues, but it becomes clear that the us becomes wider. And could it be that you and I are included in the us? That God has given us the ministry of reconciliation since we ourselves have been reconciled to God and to one another. Paul says, we are ambassadors for Christ, Christ representatives. And Paul was talking about himself and his colleagues, but it's clear when we hear the words of Jesus, the great commission to go, to make disciples, that the we there includes us as well. We are ambassadors for Christ. We will go out to be God's people in the world, we say. Ambassadors for Christ who take that wonderful message of reconciliation, that great message that God loves us and accepts us, that in Christ there is a new way of seeing and we go to look at others from now on in a new way. Not judging people by their makeup, by their hair, by their physical condition, by the color of their skin, by the sound of their accent, by the size of their bank account, the house in which they live, the car they drive, and all the other things that we have a habit of seeing first, but rather to see and to evaluate on the basis of knowing that every person is a child of God, beloved and accepted in Jesus. Let's pray. Our gracious, loving God, we bow before you and in the presence of one another and we ask in this time of prayer when and where have we really opened our eyes this week to see people not on the surface only, but to see beyond as you see beyond, to see those around us as your children and therefore as brothers and sisters, When and where, O oh God, have we been about sharing the good news of reconciliation? Reconciliation with you and reconciliation among people. When and where, O oh God, have we reached across the lines that are so often drawn to befriend one who is different from us. When and where, O oh God, have we helped to tear down a wall, a wall of hatred, a wall of prejudice? Lead us and guide us, O oh God, that we might be your ambassadors that we who have been reconciled might be about the ministry of reconciliation. In Jesus' name, amen.
Lucky, how nice I 